Good evening, I'm Jonathan Higgins. I'm Rich Carlson. And we are uh, Train Aficionado Live uh, this evening on this Monday. Welcome uh, to the show. Um, it's so nice to have you with us. If you're joining us for the first time, hit the subscribe button um, on the uh, YouTube there, and uh, we'll love that. And uh, welcome to the show. We've got a great show in store for you. Uh, we're talking about railroad photography. Uh, so we're going to give you some tips and suggestions on what to do trackside. Uh, we do have a slideshow presentation set up for you. It's going to be the first hour of the show. The uh, 30 minutes after that, which will take us right to 930, we'll answer your questions. So certainly uh, post your questions in the comments. Uh, we'll be looking through those live during the show. And of course, uh, we'll be addressing uh, some of those questions at the end of the show as well. So a lot of great check-ins there. Um, we've got uh, Chris Schultz uh, joining us. Uh, Terry's joining us. John, Brad, Vince, Ron. Wow, everybody, look at it. Yeah, just coming right on yeah. in. Oh, and of course, Dale's there. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to the show. We've got a great uh, discussion this evening. So let's, uh, let's uh, start with some of the introduction slides right now. So tonight... We're talking railroad photography. This is episode seven of season two. Um, so we're halfway through um, uh, season two, which yeah. is really good. Um, if you haven't already, uh, stay connected with us. Uh, sign up for the uh, Trackside Bulletin newsletter um, at trainaficionado.com. And as always, follow, like, and subscribe to our social media, Train Aficionado, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, there as well. So here's tonight's show, The Rundown. We're going to talk about some railroad photography tips, uh, some of my trackside stories, and then Rich is going to take us down memory lane um, with some of his photos. So Rich, uh, what are we doing tonight in your segment? Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, short lines in the Midwest during the 1980s. Nice, nice. So this should be a good... Uh, a good piece of history there. So let's um, start off with some uh, news. So as many of you know, 611, it was fully restored. It's actually been restored a couple of times. Yeah. Um, so the Spirit of Altoona, this is at the Railroad Memorial Museum in Altoona, Pennsylvania. They're actually going to be restoring this locomotive that once sat on uh, the hill at the Horseshoe Curve. Yeah, the first time I was at Horseshoe Curve, uh, 1361 was still there. It was the last summer it was there, and I got to see it while I was up on the hill. It was looking kind of derelict, but uh, the next time I was, uh, ne next time I came there, it was gone, and the Jeep was there. Yeah, so um, they're trying to restore it. So if you want to learn more about it, it's uh, railroadcity.org forward slash 1361 learn more about this restoration project they announced it sometime last month there is a video on the website so you can check that out what they have in store for the locomotive but they're quite in they're quite excited about um about it so this is going to be a good you can get my pennsylvania shirt on and... yeah i've got my uh, norfolk western shirt on so um we've got a good show in store for you so let's start with segment one railroad photography now, this was taken not too far away from the Horseshoe Curve in uh, Lily, if I remember correctly. This was in the fall, the last time I went to the curve uh, with my dad. The colors were just popping. And it just was, uh, this was Amtrak uh, heading, um, heading eastbound uh, towards the Horseshoe Curve and then heading uh, to points east. So there's a couple of tips that we recommend. Safety first. I mean, when you're taking railroad photography, you want to keep in mind, you know, that you're close to an active railroad. You want to uh, take photos from public locations off of the railroad property. Yeah. Now, there's tons of places to be able to take um, railroad photography. Some of them are known. Some of them you may be able to find. A lot of folks love, uh, you know, you've got your typical railroad crossings that some people are able to safely be able to take photos there. Um, there are uh, there are uh, pavilions to be able to yeah. take photos from, which are really neat. And more and more of those are coming about. Oh, so yeah. definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. There is a lot down here in the south. 
the railroad runs through the downtown. Yeah. So you're able to get photos at you know right on Main Street, pretty much. Yeah. Or train station uh, uh, depot platforms. Oftentimes those are open. Uh, up here where I'm at, uh, you go down to Tucson, and it's closed. You can't get in there unless there's a train and you got a ticket. But you go up to Flagstaff and it's wide open. It's a great place to watch trains. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different places. There's a lot of great websites to be able to check out um, to be able to uh, do some rail fanning on some property that is meant for rail fanning. Yeah. The other thing that, that I typically do, and I've been doing it a lot lately, is, is trying to pay attention to my surroundings. Um, I'm looking at, you know, how the light is being casted on buildings around. So a lot of times you want to pay attention to that. And, you know, and if possible, you don't want to be on the shadowed side of the train because yeah. you're going to have a shadow on that side profile of the train. So you want to be on the side where you've got really good light uh, that will be casted on the locomotive. Uh, cloudy days tend to make it a lot easier yeah. because, you know, you have equal light. But when it's bright, sunny days, it can be a little bit troublesome to be able to take photos. Yeah, on a sunny day, you want the sun to your back because otherwise you're not going to get a good detail of the locomotive and all you're going to get is a shade. And the problem is, is a lot of the my best train watching spots here are always on the dark side. So. Yeah, I mean, that's why I recommend, um, I recommend you know, scouting out locations. Um, I actually have on Train Aficionado's website, I'm building a uh, trackside guide for all through the Norfolk Southern uh, Charlotte area. And there's some that are on one side of the track and some on the other. So if you're looking to get a special heritage unit and you know that, you know, there's going to be a shadow casted on one side or the other, go to the other rail fanning spot. And that's typically what I what I use rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, DP. The other, thing, go uh, ahead. the other thing you want to do when you're maintaining an idea of your surroundings is remember where you are and what's around you otherwise. Because a lot of times the railroads aren't always in the best area of town. Um, just make sure you are aware of your surroundings, not only for the light, but for your own personal safety. Yes, that's for sure. Um, I've been working on this trackside guide for a little bit. I need to finish it up. Um, I've actually uh, photographed a lot of really good locations and, and, and some that are closer into Charlotte. Yes, it's not the best area. You, you know, you'd probably not recommend it to rail fan at night, but during the day would be great. And then there's other locations you can rail fan, you know, 24-7, oh, yeah. and it's fine. Um, the other thing with uh, with positive train, uh, was it, uh, not positive train control, uh, with uh, precision scheduling yeah. is DPUs. Um, a lot of times, you know, a lot of us will take a photo of the locomotive or locomotives at the front, and then, you know, maybe not fully pay attention. Now you need to pay attention to the whole entire train because uh, the DPU, the distributed power unit, could be a heritage unit mixed in either in the middle or at the end. So always uh, keep an eye out, even though that the train locomotives are passed, you may have a DPU mixed in there and it may be something cool. And the DPU could be in the middle of the train or the end of the train or both. Yeah, depending on the size of the train. I mean, these trains are super huge because of precision scheduling. So um, always keep that in mind. We're going to actually go over some really cool apps to be able to download as well. The other thing, you know, you may be a little bit of distance away. So we recommend a tripod. You know, tripod's going to help you to keep your camera level if you're trying to shoot far away. Um, for the most part, all the spots that I typically photograph around here, I'm pretty close. I don't need to use a tripod, but there are some cases where you're not able to get up close. You know, you're on an overpass or somewhere where you want to get a good shot, but the good shot is a distance away. So a, a tripod will be great. There's so many different cool tripods. They're not big and bulky. A lot of them are lightweight. They collapse down really small. You can, you know, they give you a bag. You can throw it on your back. Have your tripod there. Set it up in seconds. I mean, tripods have came a long, long way. Yeah. Um, and they're not that expensive. And you're right. Get a lightweight one. Uh, the question came up from uh, Bill, Mr. Stewart. 
uh, asking what a, what's a heritage unit. So, oh, we will explain that. Um, yep. Actually, what I'll do is um, uh, no, let's see so, here. I'll pull that up in a second, Norfolk. Yeah. So, so the, go ahead. Yep. So the other thing that you want to keep in mind is camera strap. Camera strap is key. A lot of people get that that typical camera strap that goes around their neck. If you've got the camera all day long, you're eventually going to feel that in the in the in the back of your your neck. Depending on the lens, if you're not using the typical kit lenses and you're using a, an upgraded lens, a lot of times the camera has substantial weight and a good lens is going to have some additional weight. Yeah. So um, the, this, the, the camera strap that I use um, goes across my chest and then it, you know, the camera will sit on my side. I just bring it up and I take a photo. It's great. I love it because I, you do a lot of walking around. Yeah. And the other thing that I've noticed when I'm driving, um, I'm able to get in the truck, keep the camera on my side. As I drive, I can hop out. The camera's right there. I can take photos. I can tell you uh, my dad texted me about one of the heritage units coming. He was down in the next town over. He says it's coming towards me. I hopped in the truck. I had my, I threw the camera on me. So all I would have to do is jump out of the truck and take the photo. And, and that's all I had literally time for. By the time it rolled into town, um, I had just uh, that amount of time. And that was, I mean, that was crazy. You know, like uh, literally, you know, he texted me. He's at the next town south of me. And um, and I was just like, all right, well, let me see if I can make it. You know, I get I hopped in the truck and sure enough, um, you know, I made it there. And it was it was just in the nick of time. I mean, it literally was. So I'm going to answer that question about heritage units. I'm going to finish up this slide and then we'll uh, take a look at some uh, examples of some heritage units. Um, the last tip that I recommend, and these can be a bit costly, Rich, as you know, batteries for cameras can be a bit costly. So if you're able to purchase an extra one, it's always yeah. good to have a backup because you never know how long you're going to be out there for. And the other thing, too, is you don't want your battery to be exhausted at the wrong time. Yeah, you got to have a, at least one, if not two, spare batteries. And depending on the batteries your camera takes, these days most cameras have somewhat proprietary battery packs. And make sure you have a couple of them and make sure they're charged. Uh, if you're going to be going on a trip, charge them the night before. <laughs> so they're charged. Yeah, definitely. It's nothing worse than having a dead battery in your camera and then finding out your spare is dead. It's like yeah, having you, a spare tire that's flat. Yeah, you don't want to have a, a dead battery, especially if you're expecting, uh, you know, expecting a heritage unit or, uh, you know, you don't want to have a dead battery. I mean that. Right. I mean, I've had, I've had a battery go exhausted on me. Um, when I was about ready to shoot a train, thank God it wasn't anything, you know, you know, like majorly special. You know, I went to go hit it and then it was like, ah, you know, it wouldn't go because the battery was exhausted. So, I mean, I figured I had a couple more photos left in it. And sure enough, you know, I didn't have any more power. It just said, ah, I'm good. Yeah. So heritage units here. Let me um, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Here we go. Okay, so heritage units. I think Norfolk Southern did the best job with heritage yeah. units. So basically what heritage units are uh, for most railroads is they pay tribute to the railroads that they took over, you know, the history. So let's say if they took over for, you know, Norfolk's, not Norfolk, uh, let's say if they took over for Conrail or, mm -hmm. or all these various railroads. Actually, they did take over for Norfolk Southern. There was another Norfolk Southern before the modern one. Yes, and it's, it's a more colorful locomotive. So uh, we can take a look at a couple of heritage units here. A um, couple, uh, you know, of course, the uh, Central Georgia Railways, the uh, Central Railroad of New Jersey. There is the Conrail one. Yeah. Uh, Delaware. The thing about it is there's still some locomotives running around in Conrail colors. <laughs> yeah. Lines and stuff. 
So these are the heritage unit uh, paint schemes. So basically what they do is they they have one of these painted in the heritage colors on a modern locomotive. Yeah. And each one of these are rolling around out and about. Um, and these are great things to try to photograph, you know, to be able to try to grab them uh, track side. We're going to go. We're going to show you a couple of tips to be able to get these. Yeah. Um, and but yeah, other other railroads have done other projects like this uh, to differing degrees. Uh, the Canadian National has done something very similar. They've taken modern locomotives in paint schemes of their older, um, uh, of their original or participant railroads or the railroads that took over. The Union Pacific uh, took their merger partners and came up with uh, paint schemes to honor them, but were not prototypical like these are. Uh, BNSF threw some stickers on a couple locomotives. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's varying degrees of uh, of this. Uh, even the CSX has done stickers. Um, yeah, the CSX was a poor attempt, but they've actually, yeah. in the last couple of years, actually did some pretty cool units, uh, yeah, tribute, uh, units. tribute units, which those can be umbrellaed underneath the heritage units. Uh, yeah. Rich, how well do you know me? Do you know what my first heritage unit was? Uh, probably uh, the um, Pennsylvania was probably the one you were looking for. I don't know if that's the one you actually caught. Yeah, well, the no, the first one I've caught. Oh, the first one you caught was probably Southern Railroad. Nope. Oh, okay. The first one I caught, which I will tell the story about that a little later on, is a Virginian. Ah, okay. Uh, so there it is right there. Um, and that has a special place because it was the first one. So, um, yeah. you know, I mean... It's awesome yeah. to be able to get those. I have a story about the uh, Pennsylvania as well. What we'll do is... And there's um, there's another type of heritage unit, and Dale reminds us of that. Um, locomotives that are still in their original paint schemes from their predecessor roads. The BNSF has got a ton of these. Uh, a lot of the old uh, Santa Fe uh, silver bonnets are still out there, but the Santa Fe's usually painted out and replaced with BNSF. Uh, there's still some of the BN, um, uh, 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 called like Grinnell Green, um, uh, uh, hair, uh, not heritage units, um, uh, executive uh, colors is what they called it. And then uh, there's still some BN green and black stuff out there, mostly on uh, you know, uh, Jeeps and stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh a lot of older uh, locomotives rolling out there that just haven't been repainted. Yeah. We'll jump back uh, to the um, to the slideshow right now and take a look at the rule of thirds. Um, this is something I typically follow and a lot of photographers tend to do this. And some of your cameras, when you're looking through the viewfinder, will have this grid, um, which will kind of help you to you know, to put, you know, the object that you're trying to photograph in one of the lines of the rule of thirds. As you can see here, this is the uh, Amtrak uh, circling the, the, rounding the bend, I should say, uh, coming from uh, the Linwood area of North Carolina and heading towards uh, Charlotte. And I was able to get the nose of the locomotive in one of the rule of thirds right on that line that's on the right. Now, the, the reason behind that is, you know, you're not dead centering the object in the photo. You see we have a really nice shot where, where you have a, a good amount of the train and the locomotive, and it just looks really good in the shot. Yeah. And you see where it is, you see where it's going, you see where it's coming from. Yes, and it looks really good. So that's something that I typically follow a lot of times is a rule of thirds. Another thing that I that I consider as well is um, your camera is only as good as the uh, the SD card that you have. You want to definitely purchase a good quality SD card. Now the reason why I get this uh, extreme uh, SanDisk um, card is because I'm able to shoot video with my camera as well. So if I ever decided I wanted to shoot video I have a card that has the capability to shoot up to 4K, uh, full HD video recording, and plus it's a really fast processing card. Yeah. Now, 
huge tip. You want to make sure that you purchase a couple of these. I have one right here. Um, you can do 64, 32 gig. A lot of times I do 16 because um, I shoot at high resolution and then I want to force myself to empty this card. Yeah. If I get a large card, I I'm going to roll around with that thing until I max it out. I'd rather you know, uh, empty it off and kind of sort it at 16 gig versus being at 32 or yeah. something higher. And then I'm like, oh my God, I've got... I've got six months worth of photos in here. It's going to take me forever to sort through this. Um, another tip. As I said, purchase these from a company like B&H Photography. They're $8.99. Yeah. Uh, don't go to CVS, Walgreens, or anything. You will pay an arm and a leg for yeah. these SD cards. And it won't even be the extreme. Right. It'll be some, you know, it'll be a lower level SD card. And and you will pay twenty five dollars or more. Yeah, and this means you have to think ahead a little bit and work on them. And remember, the thing is that the higher the resolution, the more disk space a picture or a video is going to take. Uh, the rule of thumb on four K video is about one gig per minute. So a sixteen gig card will hold about fifteen sixteen minutes of four K video. So uh, you're going to want to have a couple of yeah, I mean, you definitely do. But, you know, for the most part, I'm shooting still photography. So this is uh, fine for me. Um, that's the reason why I do the 16, because I don't want to be having to, <coughs> excuse me, you know, to go through six months worth of photography. I take a lot of photos. So, you know, like I like to have, you know, this trip categorized, this trip and so on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, always have a extra SD cards. Um B and H is a great place to purchase it from. They're not a sponsor of the show, but they're eight ninety nine. So yeah. purchase a couple of these if you're ordering any photography stuff, like typically I do. Uh, anytime that I order stuff from them, I'll throw in an SD card. I never can have enough SD cards. Yeah, you betcha. And the other thing too is the best camera to have is the one that you have. So you know uh, you can do pretty good with the cell phone, especially the newer ones. But if you're going to be doing a real camera, a good camera, uh, take care of it, feed it right, get good batteries, get good SD cards. That's for sure. Here's the gear that I've uh, that I've been using. Um, I have the Nikon uh, 5600. Uh, this is my second Nikon. My first Nikon was the 5200, which I since retired, and my wife occasionally uses it. Um, so I took, oh God, I, I want to think of the marching band, probably 15,000 photos. Um, I photographed them for four years for my, uh, my daughter's, uh, uh, was a part of the marching band, the music program, and I was the photographer through the whole entire four years of, of high school. Yeah. So I used that camera a lot. I also used it for, um, for rail fanning but more so now now that she's off at college i have more time on my hands i'm able to photograph uh, uh photograph trains more than students at the school yeah. so uh for the most part i do have my kit lenses that came with the camera but i'm using just one camera lens which is my 18 to 200 which does pretty good eventually i want to upgrade to an 18 to 400 <coughs> excuse me um so I can get a little bit more distance. Um, but yeah, I love this camera. And you know, the thing is, you know, some people like Nikon, some people like Canon. Yeah. Um, it's basically personal um, preference. So find the one that best suits your needs and uh, go from there. Hold on, yeah, I'm just going to- remember gonna... that when you invest in a camera, uh, that's only the first part. Then you're going to be starting buying lenses and such. And once you start buying lenses, you're pretty much uh, going to be a customer of that company for a long time because the Nikon lenses don't fit a Canon camera. Yeah, so there's no crossover. I mean, I believe there is some adapters, but you don't really want to do adapters because yeah. it'll downgrade uh, image quality. But yeah, I love, uh, I only have the one lens. And the reason why is I just, you know, it's this perfect utility lens. It's great for close up and it's great for uh, a little bit further out. Uh, the photo here um, is, of course, a heritage unit. Yeah. 
Uh, this is coming up the hill, uh, heading northbound, um, just out of uh, Linwood. Uh, Linwood Yard has been closed down for quite a while now, uh, for about a year, I think. It's an old hump, it's a newer hump yard um, in uh, North Carolina, and they do crew swaps for the intermodal uh, trains. So I will go up to a section which is called Lee, and I will park up there. They'll do the crew swap way down at the crest of the, you know, way down at the bottom there, and then roll up the hill. So they'll do a crew swap at a, at a street which is called Farmer's Crossing, um, right by the Linwood Yard. They'll swap out, the, the crew will swap out, and then the train will continue on its journey. But anytime there's a heritage unit in North Carolina that's heading north uh, from Charlotte and then heading uh, towards uh, my area and then heading up to, to Lee, of course, a crew swap is a great spot to be able to catch yeah. a heritage unit because you know I can typically get ahead of it, and I know they got to stop the crew swap so I can set up at Lee and then uh, catch them as they're coming up the hill. Let's continue on here. Now, a lot of the newer cameras have have apps to be able to pull these photos off real time, and typically what it requires is uh, you turning on the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi network in order to do that. With the uh, Nikon cameras, it's an app called SnapBridge. And your camera has to support, you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. Mm -hmm. So um, I use this all the time. This is part of the reason why I upgraded uh, my camera because I didn't need the adapter. With my 5200, I needed an adapter yeah. to put on there, a Wi-Fi adapter, in order to basically upload any photos from my camera to my phone and this is a lot of times when I'm out in the field uh, taking photographs, what I will do is I'll shoot the photos, watch the train go by, and then of course I have all this extra time waiting on the next train. So what I will do is I will, um, I will connect to my camera via the app, download a couple of photos, post it to uh, Instagram and Facebook, so people literally, you know, if you follow the train aficionado uh, social media, you're kind of real time rail fanning with me because you're able to see what I'm seeing out in the field um, photograph wise. Last Saturday, I was out um, uh, near Interstate 95 in North Carolina in a Rocky Mount, and I was getting some photos of some CSX uh, action out there. Uh, cool little town. I mean, it was an awesome train station. You can see that on, on our Facebook page uh, and our Instagram page uh, for some photos out there. But yeah, definitely when you look to purchase a camera, consider, um, make sure it has some uh, capability to be able to yeah. communicate with your smartphone. Yeah, yeah and that's these days, that's almost a requirement. You know, the old days, nobody would have thought of that. But now with the, you have to have that instant gratification. So uh, having that ability is just going to make your life that much better. This is the camera bag that I use. That's another key thing. You know, a lot of times the, the camera bag that comes with a kit is okay. Um, this camera bag, I wanted something that was almost like a backpack, but I wanted a sling backpack. Uh, basically goes over one side, and as you can see here, there's plenty of compartments. I can keep this on my back, sling the camera bag in front of me, pull the camera out, zip it up, and sling it on back without taking the backpack off of me. Um, so I, I wanted almost exactly the same bag. <laughs> yeah, I wanted something that was versatile when I was out and about. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to walk out to these uh, rail fanning locations and not just roadside. Sometimes you have to hike out to them. So, you know, I wanted a camera that I would be able to do that. Um, and this backpack is great. You know, there's plenty of padding um, on the shoulder. So, you know, the bag does tend to weigh if you've got your camera, your lens and some other gear, um, you know, your flash, batteries, extra lenses. You know that's certainly gonna put some weight on it, but yeah, this bag is one of the one of the cooler bags. I mean, you find your personal preference. Uh, this is something that I bought at B and H. Typically, this goes for about sixty bucks. I mean, you can find a wide range of variety of uh, bags, but definitely uh, check well, that the out. The nice thing about a bag like that is that you can take the camera out either through the side or through the front. 
and if you take it out through the side uh, when you sling it around it actually comes out the top or you can unzip the front and take it out that way so it's yeah uh, this it's, one here it's all on the side yeah the one i've got you can take it out either from the 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 front of the bag or from the side of the bag which makes it real convenient yeah i mean there's so many different bags i mean definitely check out preference i mean for rail fanning you probably want something that's versatile like a backpack type of thing so you'll be able to have all your gear with you when you hike out to a particular location now these are great apps all three of these i do use um the heritage unit app um, is a great app for tracking uh, uh, heritage locomotives and special units. The other thing too, it, you're, if you're a registered user, it doesn't cost anything, you can report sightings of these locomotives as well. Now there's so many other things that you can look up on the app, not only uh, see what heritage units are out there, you can also uh, look at the, uh, the train symbols. So if you hear, um, R12 on the scanner and you say well, where does R12 go from if you go to that portion of the app you'll be able to see R12 Norfolk Southern goes from here to here you know from this yard to this yard so you'll know it's a north south east west and you'll kind of have a an idea of where it goes um, from that and what I've been doing lately is I've been uh, with a notepad now that I have my my rooftop antenna up i've been noting every um every train that i hear on the scanner and then i'm looking it up and saying all right where does this one go where does this one originate and where does it end up and the heritage unit app is great for that as well so download the heritage app it's got a lot of great stuff in there not only for tracking the heritage units and reporting it but you know the train symbols to be able to look that up and you can type in you know some locomotive numbers and see if they're special units as well the second app which is the one in the middle um i use that quite a bit it's called snapseed and this is part of google and it's a real quick um editing uh photo editing uh app which you can bring things in there you can uh you know like uh, adjust the balance of the shot use some effects um snapseed is really cool it's simple to use it's a free app um, i would highly recommend that as well and then the last one which i have the paid version which is 199 which is not that expensive it's the um a watermark app now a lot of times there are some people that that like to steal photos so unfortunately you need to watermark your stuff so the watermark app is great once you're done doing any editing you can then watermark uh the image with your name Typically, mine will say train aficionado at the bottom right or left, um, and that's uh, something that I typically do. And these are three apps, you know, two are free, one's $1.99. And worth every penny. That's for sure. Let's continue on with the uh, slideshow. Now it's story time. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. I'm going of... to put my feet up and watch this one. Okay, so... Um, so here we go we'll start off with this one so i've been trying to get this locomotive the pennsylvania heritage unit norfolk southern pennsylvania unit for years four years um i went to altoona several times altoona pennsylvania trying to catch it in pennsylvania and missed it by an hour it went through overnight um you know it was this was the one that i missed over and over again yeah. it was elusive <laughs> so finally um i was tracking it it was coming down from somewhere up in pennsylvania bringing a load of coal uh south to a uh, power plant down here in uh, north carolina which is not too f it's a little ways from me it's a uh, a plant that's uh, near Mooresville, North Carolina. So I was sitting here working, um, tracking it each day, and I could see that it was kept getting closer and closer and closer. Um, so eventually, it made it to the Linwood Yard. So it sat in the Linwood Yard, and I watched Train Mod 5. If any of you are familiar with Train Mod 5, it's basically a software 
online software that you can see what the dispatcher sees and you can kind of track the trains. So I'm working, watch, you know, working, and then I have up on one of my screens Train Mod 5. And I keep watching to see what's coming out of Linwood. Uh, the, uh, the, the train symbol was uh, 740. So I, I also had a local feed that was close to Linwood listening to that, well, hearing traffic for that. So sure enough, towards the end of the day, I hear communication on the, on the scanner feed. Yep, uh, 740, yep, it's okay for you to uh, proceed out of Linwood uh, you've, once you have a green signal. So I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do now? You know, I don't get off work until, you know, after 5. So I end up, uh, you know, end up thinking, boy, maybe I can catch it before it goes down this branch. So what it does is it comes out of Linwood, which is the, uh, the main line there, and then it goes down the S line, which goes to uh, Asheville, which is not going to go all the way to Asheville. It's going to go down a, another line uh, down to this power plant. So I'm sitting there thinking, all right, well, I'm going to try to do this. So my, I asked my wife, when are you going to get out of work? And she's it's like, I'm running late, and then she gets stuck in traffic. So I said, all right, do you mind if I chase this? I'm going to see if I can chase it. So I hop in the truck. My truck doesn't have a full tank of gas. So I said, great. So now I'm going to try to chase this, and I don't have a full tank of gas. So I end up, I screwed out the door, and start traveling towards uh, towards Mooresville in that area. Originally, I was going to try to catch it on the S line. I said, all right, I'm going to cut it off before it goes into the power plant. So I get out to the Mooresville area. I fill the truck up with $15 worth of gas. I feel that's enough to do, just be able to splash some fuel in the truck so I'm not going to run out of gas. So... I go up to a couple of different intersections and I'm scouting it. You know, I've never rail fanned this little line that runs into the yard. And I'm thinking, what am I, you know, like which one of these, you know, at first I got to find a safe place at a crossing where I can photograph. I have to also find a place to park my truck because it's not like I can just park it on the side of the road. And, you know, I got to really get it off the road or the police are going to be saying, oh, you can't park here and so on and so forth. So originally I found this daycare center which was a building that was for sale. I said I parked in the driveway. I walked down the road and I stood there for a while, had my portable radio, and I didn't hear anything on the scanner. It was very quiet. And I saw all the railroad crossings and they're not on the quiet railroad crossings, so they can blow the horn there. So I wasn't hearing any horn activity. So I was standing there for a while. So then I, I said, all right, I think I missed it. So I walk back to the truck, you know, I get in the truck and, you know, I feel something crawling up my leg and I said, oh, crap, it was a tick. <laughs> the only thing I got from this so far was a tick. So then, so then I, I, I started heading back home. It was starting to get a little bit later. I was starting to lose light. Yeah. You know, at this point it was seven o'clock. Uh, you know, the sun was going to go down on this day around 840. So my window was getting less and less. And plus, with these railroad crossings, um, you know, the train coming through is shielded by trees. Yeah. So I'm losing light. So then I thought, let me go to the crossing I originally was going to go to, which was right before the power plant. So I drive to that crossing. It's a dead end road. So then I, you know, I go down and turn around, see if I can see into the power plant to see where they dumped the coal. Of course, I couldn't see it. So then I turned around and then I parked at the crossing. You know, I just left my truck there. There was no traffic going down this road. It was a complete yeah. dead end. So then I had the windows rolled down and I had the scanner on. I was walking outside, you know, with my camera. I figured, all right, let me give this a few minutes. And then I hear the scanner and the truck crackle, the audio. And I'm listening. I'm thinking... What was that? Let me go grab my portable. I didn't have my portable on me. So I get in there, and um, and I finally hear something, you know, audible. Hey, can you hear me? I'm at mile post eight. I'm like, I was just at mile post eight. Is that the train? And I'm like, son of a gun, that's the train. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to get this. So 
I ended up uh, waiting there, and I finally got the Pennsylvania. So it was at the tail end of the train because when they, what they end up doing is they go beyond this branch line, and there's helpers on the rear. So the helper became the lead unit, and then the heritage unit was on the rear because they're backing in. All right. So I ended up being uh, waiting there. And of course, I saw the coal hoppers pass me. So I'm waiting and waiting for the Pennsylvania. So I said, all right, this is going to be my, what you see here is the best shot that I'm going to be able to get of the Pennsylvania. And sure enough, you know, this was the shot I ended up posting on social media across the board. Oh, yeah. And it was just, you know, I was able to get it. The thing was the sun was setting. You know, I had, I had only a window of opportunity which was a couple of seconds because it was going to be right at this spot where I could get a couple of shots, and I was able to get two good shots. But yeah, this this was that, the Pennsylvania. It was a great shot with the shadow of the cross buck on the on the cab. And I was just you know like I was bound and determined to catch this train, and I finally did. This train, I've been lucky enough to be able to photograph it a couple of times, and this, of course, is six eleven the queen of steam um it spent a lot of time at the north carolina transportation museum rich last year because of covid yeah um it didn't venture out because a lot of places were closed so i went over to the uh to the transportation museum several times to visit it the first time i photographed her was before i moved down here and you know my wife and i came down here for a trip and I photographed it, and then we didn't end up chasing it because we weren't familiar with the area. At this yeah. point, I'm familiar with the area. I could have chased this. It was going down the S line. Yet again, another train going down the S line. It was going all the way to Asheville. So I would have known enough spots to be able to chase it. Um, so 611 left, um, left late. They originally had an issue with 611. Uh, going up to Strasburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, with the uh, auger. There was an issue with the auger. They had to replace the auger. And then once that was all set, I was able to capture this photo of it running on its own through the museum and then hitching on to a Norfolk Southern locomotive because it, because of, um, uh, was it a I drawing a blank rich you know because you have to have the computer systems in oh, there it because it's, yeah it doesn't have a P, um, PTC PTC so so they you know so I was able to get this photo of it rolling up to be hitched on and I was so excited to be able to get this you know because a lot of people were going to capture photos of this of course the Norfolk Southern engine was going to be in the front of it yeah so I was able to capture this and um, I've actually seen the six eleven. Uh, it came through Chicago, wow, 20, 25 years ago, something like that. Um, and uh, it was on a uh, special going through uh, town. I got, I was, I was working when it came through, and I got assigned to the uh, traffic detail to close to, uh, to keep people off the uh, platform while it was going through to keep them from getting hit. So. Yeah, the six eleven is originally from the Roanoke area, and. The Roanoke, um, the Virginia Transportation Museum, I believe, owns it. And then the North Carolina Museum has a facility to be able to work on this locomotive. So it spends some of its time in North Carolina because they check it, do maintenance and so on to it. And then, you know, it's been going to Stridesburg because it has a long you know, a long, they have a long right of way which they're able to use yeah. uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, passenger yeah, for uh, excursions. excursions. But yeah, I mean, the 611 is such a beauty. Oh, yeah. I, well, that bullet nose is just, uh, it's iconic. And this is something I totally, I loved uh, being able to photograph this. Yeah. Last fall, um, a lot of people go to the horseshoe curve. There is a spot on the other side, which you can see from this photograph here, that is really a cool spot for taking photos. My dad and I went out uh, to the Horseshoe Curve back in the fall of last year. We actually did a live show from, uh, from, the, uh, from Altoona um, that weekend that we were there. And 
we climbed up the other side of the hill and boy was it a climb i mean him and i were were out of breath by the time we got up there but we got spectacular shots of trains rounding the curve it's far enough off of the the right away to be able to get some photographs safely and this is uh one uh intermodal uh, train heading around the curve heading west and this was a, a great shot i really totally enjoyed uh taking that shot of the uh, horseshoe curve um one other story uh that i want to mention before we go into uh, rich's photo archive so I've been able to take my wife, my dad, rail fanning, and uh, my daughter, Courtney, uh, went to the Horseshoe Curve on the way back to uh, college. Her and I uh, were driving north from North Carolina up to uh, UVM, which is uh, University of Vermont in Burlington. So I made sure that we left a day or two early so we could make a stop in the Altoona area so I kind of worked it into the thing um, this is the first time that she's done like a rail fanning trip or little rail fanning trip with me a so trip. yes so as most of you know there's a cast of characters a lot of times rail fanning trackside and uh, she was with me and we were at one of the spots uh, around the horseshoe curve and there was a couple of guys younger guys uh, rail fanning and the conversation that they were having with this older gentleman um, he is also from the same areas they are and apparently they're Facebook friends or whatever the heck it is and the older man didn't want anything to do with them you know you know the one of the younger kids was saying you know we should go to dinner tonight I ain't going where you're going and we're listening to this conversation you know he's an old crotchety old man I ain't going where you're going and then he said, I know where you've been all the weekend because all you do is post it on Facebook. <laughs> Get me on the conversation. So, of course, Courtney's with me. Mm -hmm. And she brought her nook with her. So she's, you know, uh, you know, reading, yeah. you know, reading while I'm waiting for a train to come. So she's listening to this conversation going on. So at one point, she grabs her phone and she's texting me, sitting right next to me she said i haven't turned the page in 10 minutes listening to this conversation <laughs> in between this older gentleman and these three guys just going back and forth and you know there was some colorful discussion yes yes as well and i was like and you know i was listening to it too because i was just waiting on the train i didn't realize that she was she's sitting there you know 20 30 minutes now not you know she has her nook in front of her but she's not turning the page because she's listening to this dialogue because it's always a cast of characters track side yeah you've got the good the bad and the just plain weird yes <laughs> um but yeah those are some cool stories that i wanted to share with you guys let's uh uh, jump into um, Rich's photo archive. So this is dating back to the 1980s, right, Rich? Yeah, that was the height of my rail fanning. Um, and um, at these pictures, most of these were taken with a Pentax A3000, uh, which was a 35 millimeter film camera. If you're old enough to remember film and cameras, uh, that's what most of these pictures were taken and then uh, on slides. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to get them scanned until a little year or so ago, so some of the coloring is not as good as it could be. So uh, this is the Wisconsin and Southern. It's a GP9, used to be a Rock Island uh, unit, and this is at their roundhouse in Janesville. And I took this picture in 1983. And this was just an hour trip for me from, uh, uh, from where I was living. Okay, and this is a modern camera that you're able to use at yeah. this point. This is my current camera. I've had it for about 10 or 12 years or so. Um, I had a bunch of friends of mine uh, back in the Chicago area that had this exact same setup. So uh, I went with that because I saw pictures that they took and how good they looked. So uh, the camera is an EIS 7D um, digital camera. It uses the older compact flash cards, which are physically larger. Um, the capacity is not nearly as they're not nearly as good as the newer SD cards, but at the time it was pretty much cutting edge. Uh, the camera, I, the lens I bought with it was the 18 to 200, uh, and it was my first image stabilizing lens which I ever had. Oh, what a joy that was! 
if you've never used an image stabilizing lens, um, get one. You'll love it. And then I got the uh, 75 to 300, so I get a little bit more distance. But the problem with that is you lose the real close-up stuff. The closest stuff you can get pictures of is a little bit further back. And then uh, I got my big lens, and this cost more than a camera, and that's the uh, 100 to 400 lens, and that is a fantastic lens. Again, it's great for distance stuff, but uh, it's you got to get further away from your target. And this lens is so heavy that you mount on the tripod, you mount it to the camera, and then you mount the lens to the tripod because the lens is bigger, heavier than the camera, and it costs more too. So. Uh, that was my baby, and that was a uh, birthday gift from my honey. Yeah, I, I the, the the lens that I want to get, as I mentioned earlier, was the eighteen to four hundred. It's not uh, super expensive, and it'll do the close up stuff and the far away stuff. Yeah. I just want to get a little bit more distance. Like there's some rail fanning spots that um, that I go to. I want to be able to get a little bit more distance on it, and I think that will do the job. So look at yeah. this one here. Yeah, that is an old Alco S2 switcher. Uh, it's on a Kankakee Beaverville in Southern, um, which is a short line that runs from Kankakee, Illinois, which is roughly 50 or 60 miles south of Chicago, uh, kind of about halfway between Chicago and Champaign. And then they uh, head down into Indiana. Um, and uh, that uh, used to be uh, used to belong to the Terminal Railway Association uh, uh, switching road around St. Louis. And I caught that sitting in a field someplace out uh, southern, uh, probably around Beaverville or uh, Donovan or someplace like that. Uh, I think it had been sitting there for a while. It probably, it probably died there. They cut it off and left it. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, and the KBS uh, was kind of uh, famous in the Chicago area because when they started out, they were mostly an Alco road. Uh, they had a couple of uh, former uh, Green Bay and Western units and a few other uh, Alco units, and this is one of them that I happened to catch. So this was the Brilliant and Forest Junction. This was about a six-mile-long short line on former Northwestern track that ran between Brilliant and Forest Junction, Wisconsin. And Forest Junction is where they met up with, at that time, it was the uh, Wisconsin Central, um, and they had bought that from the Sioux line. And uh, it was this little rinky-dink uh, operation. This was their only locomotive. They had three employees at the railroad. One, uh, one girl worked in the office, and two guys that worked the locomotive. They were the mechanical shop. They were everything else. And my brother-in-law and I, who you can see my brother-in-law in the picture uh, next to the, uh, on the brilliant picture. He's in the back there. Um, oh, yeah, right, right over here. Yep, yeah, that's my brother-in-law. So, and my brother-in-law is actually in the locomotive in this picture, uh, on, on the left picture. So we stopped in this little town of Brilliant. Kind of, we didn't know much about it, and we we heard about this thing. So we found it, and we're taking pictures, and these two guys come up to us and kind of give us a hard time. Oh, go take pictures of pretty girls or something like that. Well, it turns out they were the railroad <laughs> employees. And they said, come back after lunch, and we'll give you a ride. And we're going to we're going to Forest Junction. So we came back after lunch, and um, I rode the first half, and uh, Tom rode the second half. And you know, he stopped in the middle of some place. So we swapped them until we got the car because they weren't coming back. So um, got a cool uh, cab ride on the uh, number five. It's an old uh, Milwaukee road, obviously. If you're from the Midwest, you recognize the paint scheme, and that's a Alco RSC two. Wow. Really and that line cool. is long gone now. The tracks are gone, and even the line it connected to is gone. Oh, jeez. So the Chicago, Madison, and Northern, um, they were a short line that ran from uh, Fox Lake, Illinois, up into Janesville, and down towards uh, the uh, Freeport, Illinois area, and some other tracks in southern uh, Wisconsin. And... After the Illinois Central abandoned their line from Freeport North, the Chicago Madison and Northern got it, and then it, they picked up some old Milwaukee Road track that, uh, in that Janesville area. And this was one of their units. It's a uh, former rock, uh, uh, Rio Grande uh, F7, and it's uh, the, the unit is currently out on the ELS, but it hasn't run in years. 
And this was on an excursion they ran from Janesville down to uh, Fox Lake. And I'm pretty certain it was in Walworth. It could have been another small town there. I don't remember, but uh, I didn't ride this train, but uh, I chased it all the way through. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, now that track is all the Wisconsin Southern, which they took over about a year or two, year or two after this picture was taken. Wow. It looks beautiful. So this is the Crandick, uh, the Cedar Rapids in Iowa City. And obviously it runs between those cities. And they use a, this unit, even though it looks like it's in Union Pacific paint, that's actually the paint scheme that Crandick used. Uh, it was very similar to uh, the U UP colors. And uh, this was an old Milwaukee Road uh, GP9. And uh, in the background, you'll see an SW8. Uh, that SW8 was actually bought new by the Crandick back in the 50s. And this unit here was, uh, was bought from the Milwaukee Road. And they're still around. The Craddock is still around. Um, and they still do local switching. They got it. It's a typical Iowa short line. Oh, really nice. Let's see here. All right. So this we're going to go a little bit further south. This is in Dequeen, Arkansas, uh, back in 1989. Uh, this is the Texas, Oklahoma, and Eastern. And they, they have an affiliated road. And I think it's. Uh, I don't remember the name of the affiliated road, but uh, there's two short lines that are common ownership, and they look very similar. And unusually with them is they number their locomotive D12 or D7 uh, because back in the days before they had diesel locomotives, they had uh, steam locomotives. And then when they came up with diesels, they figured they'll put a D in front of it for diesel. And this was uh, this is a GP40, which they bought new. And they've been around forever, and they bought some of their locomotives new, and some of them they bought used. And this was one of them that we just kind of, uh, I was on my way someplace else, and I came across it, and it was just one of those lucky things that I found it. So this is the Detroit and Mackinac. They, um, they, run, uh, they ran uh, a bunch of lines, mostly uh, uh, old Pennsylvania lines uh, in uh, Central and Northern Michigan, and uh, they had Alcos, and uh, they bought this unit. It was originally from the Pennsylvania. They bought it from Conrail, um, and they numbered their diesel locomotives, diesel locomotives by the month and year that they acquired them. So, 281 was bought in February of 1981, and 1181 was bought in November of 1981. Kind of an odd system to number locomotives, but that's what they did. They had a real snazzy paint scheme, uh, the ones that they did paint. But otherwise, uh, it was one of those typical short lines, uh, a little bit of flash, but not a lot of substance. And they never did a lot of uh, maintenance on them. And now I think most of that track that's left is run by Lake States. And this was a really neat operation. Uh, this is in Manistique, Michigan, which is uh, just north of the Wisconsin line in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And that is an electric locomotive with a car body uh, in the back. So um, it not only propels the train, but it also carries their load. Uh, and it's uh, aggregate lime and stone from a quarry. And uh, it's... Uh, and it's just kind of a little odd captive uh, electrically operated industrial line that runs from the port in Manistique up to the uh, quarry up uh, a couple miles north of town. I think they only had like eight miles of track and they had a bunch of these little electric things, <laughs> critters as I call them, and a couple dozen uh, uh, side uh, dump hoppers. Uh, a couple of years after I took this picture, probably around 1990-ish or so, uh, they abandoned the electrification, and now they run it with a couple of diesel switchers. Oh, wow. And this is another uh, local road that I got to ride. Uh, this is the Iowa Railroad. Uh, they uh, run, ran the old Rock Island tracks uh, through northern Illinois and into Iowa before the Iowa Interstate took over. When, they went, when these guys went bankrupt, the Iowa Interstate took over and are still running that track. 
Uh, this is an old youth, uh, U20, I'm sorry, U30B run, uh, came from the uh, Illinois Central. And again, Tom, my brother-in-law and I were, uh, went down to Bureau, Illinois, which is, I don't know, 150, 200 miles outside of Chicago and a little bit to the south and quite a bit to the west. Um, and they uh, were uh, switching these grain cars. There was a grain elevator and a, uh, and a grain dock, a uh, barge dock for the river, uh, not far from here. And they were switching these. And so the picture on the left, I took from the bridge that you can see on the picture on the right. And then uh, we were out there taking the pictures. The guys invited us up into uh, the locomotive, and we switched cars with them for the afternoon and had an absolute blast. Got to handle the throttle, and do all that kind of stuff. So I mean, that was a rail fan's dream, you know. So that we, we so love that. Cool. And this is the Illinois Terminal. Uh, this was one of the few units I ever saw of the Illinois Terminal. Um, they were a former interurban that ran from uh, St. Louis and through uh, southern Illinois between like Springfield and Peoria um, and it was an electric interurban which as they started as the interurban phase started to uh, fade away uh, they ended up being bought out by the class one railroads that ran in the area Norfolk and Western Pennsylvania see a uh, Chessie system Illinois Central, they all bought this and used it as a terminal road. So they would connect with the bigger roads and handle the local switching. And eventually the Norfolk and Western bought out the other partners and merged the Illinois, uh, used to be Illinois Traction. And then when it became a terminal road, they called it Illinois Terminal. And then they merged that into the Norfolk and Western. So um, they didn't repaint the locomotives, but as they broke down, they would store them. And I caught that one in the Decatur yard um, on the uh, Norfolk and Western. And the cat, the uh, stacks were capped, so you know it wasn't going to run again. At least not from them. And uh, that brings us an example of a heritage unit. Yeah, there it is, there right there. There you go. <laughs> and there's me taking a photo of the Illinois Terminal going around the Horseshoe Curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was um, uh, that was a very bright lime green, and you can see they got the colors right. Yeah, they totally did. And then on the end, um, what I'll do is I'll go back to the uh, slideshow in a moment, and I'll pull that up, and you can see that the lines that are whoops, I'm drawing on the wrong screen. But you can see this lines here that were in the front of that locomotive were there. Um, you know, they really got it down. We'll pull up Rich's uh, shot again so we can see that. But that's a prime example of, um, let me just pull it up here. Yeah. Give me a second, and then we'll go back to here. They did it right. Yeah, see it right here? You've got it right down the lower path. The, the yellow is right there, and then the yeah, green. That, and like I say, that's a very, it was a very bright lime green. And there is a new short line railroad um, that uses IT paint. It's not running, they're not running on old IT trackage, but they're, or they're calling it the Illinois, I'm not sure if it's Illinois Terminal, if they're calling it that now, but there's a new short line down the area, and they're using the same paint scheme. So it's kind of a heritage to the old to the old railroad, kind of like the uh, new Rock Island, which is on some former uh, track, uh, somebody, some former, um, I think it's the only central track down in Mississippi. It has nothing yeah. to do with the original Rock Island, but these guys are rail fans and they bought their own railroad and they like the Rock Island. Yeah, it's that looks really cool too. I've seen the paint scheme of that. So where this blue reminds me of uh, Conrail blue. Yeah, and... Um, this, uh, even though this wasn't a former Conrail unit, it is very similar to the old Conrail Blue. This is Sea Dog One, um, otherwise known as LaSalle and Bureau County, uh, number 273. This was towards the end of the LaSalle and Bureau County days, and when they were transitioning to uh, the Chicago, um, uh, the Chicago International Port, and the um, oh, I can't remember the name of the Chicago Rail Link is what it's known as nowadays 
The LaSalle and Bureau County used to be a short line in the LaSalle and Bureau County area. In fact, where that uh, picture of the Iowa Railroad, uh, it was in that area where they ran. It was only a few miles away from there. And they got caught up in a situation during the Penn Central, uh, when Penn Central was going under. Uh, they bought a bunch of boxcars from uh, Penn Central, uh, well, an affiliated company bought a bunch of boxcars and they were going to fix them up and then use them as leasing cars well for some reason penn central was so messed up that they kept on sending them boxcars and kept on sending them boxcars they were supposed to buy 150 and i think they got about 500 of them and they figured okay great they're just sending it to us they fixed them up and started leasing them out and turned into a big scandal and they thought they were stealing them but it was like a paperwork snafu supposedly and eventually the track in Outstate Illinois was abandoned, and they were just running this track, that the old Rock Island track in the Chicago area for uh, switching. Wow. This is another one of those little Michigan short lines that um, ran for a few years. This was the Michigan Northern. Uh, again, it was mostly old Conrail track or Penn Central track up in the uh, northern part of the southern peninsula of Michigan. Uh, this was the uh, originally a Litchfield Madison uh, RS3, and then it be, uh, went to the Northwestern after the Northwestern bought the Litchfield Madison. This was actually the last RS3 built. They built what, close to a thousand of them? And this was the very last one built in 1956. Wow. And it ran on the Michigan Northern for a while. They ran excursion service like a lot of these short lines did back in the uh, 70s and 80s uh, before the insurance crisis took over. And uh, they had a few uh, EMDs, they had a few uh, Alcos, and being an Alco guy, that's the one I took a picture of. And this is back in the film days when you had to be a little more careful with what you took pictures because it cost you about a dollar per picture between the film and the process. Yeah, it was very expensive to uh, yeah. uh, to photograph, you know, back then. And it, you know, at least now, you know, with an SD card, you can go to town taking oh, photos yeah. and take different angles, and and you're not paying to develop it. You know, you're only printing. You know, you're printing. You know, the photos that you want after you've checked them, mm -hmm. and then you can either print them uh, with your own printer or you can have them printed professionally through Walgreens, and you do it online. You upload yeah. it. And then you go there and pick it up. Yeah, I've done that a few times. Uh, gotten the uh, um, the what it, the five by nines or eight and a half by eleven uh, you know, pictures, the larger format pictures, and you send them to people who are uh, uh, you want to. We did that with the uh, Ellis and I when we were rail fanning up there, and they would give us permission to be on the track or on the property to take pictures. So in order to say thanks, we had a bunch of these printed up for us, and we sent them to them. And last time we were in the office, sure enough, our pictures were uh, on their office walls, which we thought was pretty cool. Which is awesome. So uh, that wraps up the presentation of our show. We're going to uh, dive in some questions and maybe some additional talk uh, for the next 30 minutes. We want you to make sure that you stay connected to Train Aficionado. You want to hit the subscribe button watching us right now on YouTube. Um, uh, follow and like our social media as well along with YouTube. With uh, We're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. So make sure you uh Subscribe to all of our social media channels. Uh, check out our website, trainaficionado.com. Sign up for the Trackside Bulletin uh, on our website. You can check out the blogs and the various things that we have on the website. The other thing that we're looking for is upcoming guests on the show. We had um, Danny Harmon from Distant Signal. Uh, on the show and that was a great interview we had a great time with him uh we hope to have him back on again i mean we squeezed in as much as we could in the 90 minutes but we could have kept talking uh for hours on that particular show and i think we did after the show <laughs> yeah yeah we talked to him for a while uh after the show as well um if you can't get enough of uh, rich and i uh, join us on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have an interview on our Scanner Guys show um, with uh, with a ham radio operator. It's going to tell us all about um, the traffic net that he hosts in upstate uh, New York uh, uh, near Albany. Uh, Jock will be uh, talking to us uh, live on the show. Uh, that'll be Wednesday, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. 
uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time on July 7th, so this Wednesday. So definitely uh, join us for that as well. Um, and then, of course, our next show, we host these the first Monday of every month. So next uh, show will be August the 2nd, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. And we would love to... Um, you know, to be able to get some guests on. If there's anybody that you know that you could recommend, um, you can certainly uh, email us at trainaficionado at gmail.com. Um, we would love to uh, get some guests on the show to talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know what you've done with rail fanning or, you know, um, you know anything at all that's involving trains and rail fanning. We would love to have you, have you on. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions and comments. We've got a lot of... Uh, a lot of check-ins this evening um, from all over the place, which is oh, yeah. which is awesome. Um, welcome if you're a first-time viewer of the uh, of the show. Uh, Terry had some uh, some interesting news here. Uh, looks like there's going to be uh, some faster trains traveling uh, yeah. in Illinois. So uh, Illinois uh, Department of Transportation, in cooperation with the Union Pacific and uh, Amtrak, has been working on the track that heads from Chicago, the Chicago area to the St. Louis area. And that goes through uh, Joliet, uh, Springfield, Alton, and then down to St. Louis. And they want to make that into high-speed rail. And they're trying to get to 100 mile. In fact, uh, 100 mile per hour track. If you go back in the trains magazine uh, five or six months ago, they had an article about Midwest speed, about this and some other work in Michigan doing the same thing. And uh, finally, they're starting to make some good progress. So it's going to go, uh, they're not going to hit 100 miles an hour yet, but the uh, speed limit's going to be going to 90, which is pretty darn fast on the train. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, compared to the Northeast Corridor, you know, where yeah. you're getting about 150. Um, yeah, but out in the cornfield country, that this is fast. Yeah. <laughs> woo, woo, the oh, cornfield, yeah, yeah that's I, for sure. Now, I've been on this train several times, and, you know, it feels fast at 75, 79 miles an hour. Uh, the track wasn't quite as good as, as it is now. In fact, we bottomed out once or twice on some grade crossings, but... Um, you know, they're adding, they're going to add some uh, speed to it. They're going to be going 90. Uh, there is a video on YouTube of uh, one of the test runs where they ran the train at 110, I think, um, through a little town called Dwight, which is 120, 150 miles south of Chicago for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles. And, I mean, they had guards at the grade crossings and stuff like that to make sure that the, you know, the gates were going to go down properly and such. And, uh, you know, seeing the, uh, uh, the signals go by like that, it was, it was pretty awesome to see. All right. Let's see. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of check-ins. So I'm just yes, going to see. The we've, is gone. Um, the heritage units. Yes, we covered yes. that. Um, yeah. So definitely uh, check out the heritage unit app. Um, the great thing about that app is you can look at some of the heritage units that are each one of the railroads and you can see photographs of them, uh, yeah. which is great. And it's not just the special paint. It's the old paint schemes that are still left over uh, or for some some locomotives that are some for some reason noteworthy. Yes, Thank like there's the, the barcode unit, yeah. uh, which is uh, Norfolk Southern uh one 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 and so it's right. got four ones so it looks like a barcode yeah. yeah and there are a few other locomotives that are special in you know one way or the other uh looks like wayne's gonna be riding the uh amtrak uh, signal train tomorrow to washington um i've ridden on the northeast corridor a couple times you have too um and there. and wayne um wayne has done some work for the train aficionado website um, which uh, everybody can check out. Let me just uh, let me pull up some of his work here. Um, he's actually working on um, putting together a trackside guide for that area, um, and he's been sending me updates periodically. I have to. I believe I'm an update behind, but he's done some really good work. Let me just uh, pull it up here. Um, oops. Let's see here. I just made it so it didn't share the screen. Here we go. Hold on one second. Share screen. Having ridden the Northeast Corridor, that's a lot of fun. 
So um, if you take a look at trainaficionado.com under trackside guides, there's a couple of different guides that we're working on. Of course, you know, there's the, uh, the Altoona guide that I worked on. And then the work in progress is the uh, Charlotte district. So Wayne has sent us uh, information about the various lines in this section, this Mid-Atlantic division. And it's well detailed. I'm going to pull this up right now. It's a PDF, which you can download and print. And you can see, you know, all the mile posts and the channel assignment uh, for each one of these sections. And then the stations are also marked on here as well. Um, very detailed. So if you're from this area and you're rail fanning some of the passenger stuff, you may want to download this, print it off, or have it bookmarked on your cell phone. So when you hear radio traffic at milepost um, milepost 19.7, you know it's uh, at at Union um, North Coast Line there, and you're and you'll be able to know where the trains are and in, in relationship to you. So definitely. Uh, check out uh, Wayne's work at trainaficionado.com under trackside guides and then mid Atlantic division for the Northeast corridor. Really, really good stuff. So it looks like uh, Trey uh, caught the Monaga, Monaga Gila, if I can say that. That's a hard word to say, Monaga Gila, the Virginian and the Lehigh Valley units, all his DPUs. So I, my favorite is the Lehigh, Lehigh Valley. I mean, I, I just love that red paint scheme that they had. That one I don't have. Um, the Lehigh Valley. I was. I have to start going through my photos. I've been photographing in them, and then I haven't been keeping track of which ones I have. Yeah. From last, I think I have about half. Uh, maybe a little bit more than half, but I'm going to go through. I'll be able to look through my Instagram account and be able to see the uh see how many i have and check them off but yeah i mean yeah. i enjoy chasing them they're a lot oh, of fun yeah. well i see them on this cameras a lot i i watch the cameras at horseshoe or, or or chesterton or stuff like that and you see a lot of the uh, a lot of the heritage units uh going through there but i've never caught one of the norfolk southern heritage units live so one of these days i'm gonna but uh yeah <laughs> I'm going to one of these days. So they all seen a bunch of different ones from different roads on uh, on some of the long trains, both leadings and as DPUs. So that's the neat thing about North American railroading is, for the most part, uh, a locomotive from Railroad A can run on Railroad B, and not, and you know they just dial up the right radio channel and dial in the right EOT device, and off they go. Uh, there are a few situations where that's not quite possible but for the most part any railroad locomotive any railroads locomotive can run on any other railroad may not be able to lead but at least it it can run in the one even uh you, you see in this area we see a lot of fairmex uh locomotives coming up out of mexico um obviously the cn and cp both have operations in both canada and um and the states and in fact even the bnsf has got tracks in canada so uh that part is not such a big deal but um there's no reason why you can't run a kcs locomotive on the bnsf um or the norfolk Southern. in fact i see a lot of norfolk southern these days going through flagstaff uh let's see here uh gala check-ins from all over the place and uh, let's see here. Did we uh, hear about the train record? Uh, the train wreck in Lacombe, Alberta. Uh, some tank cars carrying tar oil and sand, uh, tar and oil sand. I haven't heard about it, but uh, I haven't either. You know, I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, I mean, there's quite a uh, is there's more derailments than 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 I like to hear about. You know, out there, yeah. so it's hard to keep track of all of them. Yeah, I mean. I've actually seen rare, uh, derailments happen in front of me. Uh, we I told that story about when I was in Fort Worth years ago on one of the previous shows, and that's scary. And that was a relatively minor one, and that's scary to see happen. I can't imagine, you know, having to deal with a you know a big time derailment or something like that. The hazmat. So uh, Trey likes using his iPhone 12 Pro. It does a lot better than most camcorders. Um, I do a lot of rail fanning with my iPhone 12 Pro Max. It's uh, it's got a great camera on it, um, and some of the newer uh, Samsung 
cameras, uh, 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 phones have got great cameras, but the you can't beat a good SLR for things like depth of field and the lens arrangement and, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, the, so. the still photography, you're limited still on the iPhones and the Samsungs. Yeah. But for the most part, for video, um, if you're not having to work, you know, you're fairly close, it's yeah. phenomenal for video. Oh, like yeah. a lot of times I will use my iPhone, you know, we're both iPhone uh, people, but I will use my iPhone for video and then still photography. I'll use my my uh, camera, my actual yeah. camera, and and I find you know it's a perfect pairing. I mean, a lot of times I will I will post some video of the train passing. What I'll do is I'll get the locomotive shots and then I'll post uh, some uh, video of of the train passing through um, yeah. to my Instagram account, and it looks phenomenal. Yeah, and again, like I said before. The best camera to use is the one that you have. So if all you've got is a smartphone, more power to you, friend. Uh, yeah, you might be limited in some of the things you can do, but at least you're going to get a picture of it. And the whole idea behind a picture of a train is to remember what you saw and to be able to go back and say, hey, this is what I saw, or be able to share it. And you can do that with you know, a $2,000 camera setup, or you can do it with your iPhone. Mm -hmm. Or even you know uh, even a cheap uh, uh, point and shoot. Uh, see here. Uh, oh, Wayne's got a great uh, tip here. When you're doing video, zoom out slowly and then zoom in slowly, and don't pan left to right real quickly. So the whole idea behind taking a video and as the camera is moving is you want to keep your motion as slow and as steady as possible. Don't take pictures like this. Take pictures like this. Your arms in makes the picture steady. Move your body like this if you can. Uh, again, you're trying to keep the uh, camera as steady and as smooth as possible. When you're doing this, your arms are going to shake a lot, and it's very hard to keep things steady. Keep your arms in and close, and your uh, image and your video is going to be a lot less shaky. There's nothing worse than getting seasick by watching a train video. Yeah, you definitely want to. Uh, um, you definitely want to, uh, you know, act as you're the tripod. Yeah, yeah, and if you can use a tripod, that's even better. Uh, I actually have a tripod mount for uh, my phone, um, and it actually works pretty well. Uh, I the other thing I've got is uh, up there is I've got a gimbal for my phone and that actually connect, uh, communicates with the phone so you put the phone in the gimbal and not only does it stabilize the phone and makes it a smooth move you can also zoom in and tilt the camera uh, left right up and down with the uh, thumb, uh, thumb controller on the gimbal so that's something you may want to consider investing in if you're going to use your phone as your main camera is a gimbal uh, Terry says that the newest Samsung phones uh, have incredible quality and features. They have three lenses, uh, like the iPhone, the newer iPhones do as well. But they got eight, uh, 128 megapixels in 8K video and great low light videos. Um, I had my old phone, which was the iPhone 10 Max, um, and I was down in Maricopa, Arizona, which is I don't know, 150 miles from here, and uh, got the Amtrak came in, coming in at about 5:30 and six o'clock in the morning, and it was just starting to get light. I mean, it was basically it was still dark, and it was just starting to get light. And I was taking pictures with that uh, iPhone 10 and uh, video, and it almost looked like daylight. The only way you could tell that it was at night was because all the lights were on. So uh, the phones these days have got some great low light uh, capabilities. And uh, be careful that your phone doesn't overheat. Um, if you're and the same thing with the with the digital camcorder, um, be careful of the heat. And if you're using a SLR camera, while they're not usually generating a lot of heat, protect them from the heat. Don't leave them in the uh, uh, in the car when the uh, sun is going through the windshield and just magnifying that. Uh, Les is looking to listening to the Metrolinx uh, trains on Broadcastify. Uh, it says that's good listening. Yeah, it's, um, 
if you can't be trackside uh, at, with your scanner, the next best thing is to uh, listen to uh, listen to them online. And it's great if you can listen to the audio, the scanner audio, while you're uh, watching uh, one of the live feeds too. And let's see here. Yeah, the bo the uh, 125. Jonathan's my favorite rail fang scanner is the BC 125 AT. Uh, it has not been discontinued. And if you're a scanner guy's fan, you will know all about that. Yeah, the 125 AT is certainly the go to radio. Um, I don't have it beside me right now because I, I took it with me this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the 125 AT uh, definitely is a good unit to take a look at. We've written, I've written several blog entries about the 125 uh, on the Train Aficionado blog. So if you're not familiar with it, take a look at some of the blog entries. I've given a review of it and some of the the key features uh, for a rail fan. So definitely uh, check out the Train Aficionado law blog and then search for the 125AT. Uh, there was a question earlier about the 611. Was it built in Roanoke? Um, and Trey yes. says yes. Yep. Yes. And so does Jonathan. Very good. Yeah, it was. Uh, there's a. Uh, they were, there's a uh, the, the the plate the number plate that's on there which says says it was built in Roanoke and uh, it's been restored uh, a couple of times uh, yeah. since the uh, the first uh, the first time it went out when it was new um, the reason why 611 is the only one of its type out there is just because of it had some issues in the beginning. I went to a presentation at the uh, North Carolina Transportation Museum, and it was involved in a wreck early um, when it first rolled out, and then it didn't have a lot of uh, service miles in the beginning. Yeah. So that one was in the best shape out of all the uh, the locomotives in that series, and and it became the only one that was there. I mean, it was a sitting as a museum display for quite a while yep. and then it was uh restored to uh to operate yeah. and then it um was restored again to operate well, that's kind of a common theme is um, is restoring museum pieces to operation uh look what the up did with the was it 4014 mm -hmm. uh recently they restored that big boy um yeah, a couple of the other ones. The uh, 261 was sitting in a museum in Wisconsin, and they restored that. In fact, I was at that museum, uh, the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay uh, area. I was there the day that they took it out of the museum to send it up to, I think, uh, Eau Claire or Minneapolis to get uh, to get uh, refurbished. And I was watching them pull that uh, pull it out of the museum, and that was just by chance. I didn't know that was going to be happening that day. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, William went to the Horseshoe Curve back in 1964. Boy, that had to be cool. They still had four tracks through there. Um, yeah, that was uh, the the additional track was t uh, taken out when Conrail took over the yeah. the line. Is that right? And you can still see that where the middle track would have been. Right. Um, and they basically a lot of the. Uh, uh, you know the, the the pickup trucks will travel through there using that as yeah. a roadway yeah they use it as a service road well, the first time i went to the curb which would have been 85 uh the fourth track was still there and i think they pulled it out in the later 80s because i was there at least twice when the uh when uh, when the four tracks were there and they took out uh, i think it was uh, track three um late late 80s if i recall correctly I, I could tell you there's some days they, they could use that fourth track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you you got to wonder why they pull, uh, you know, the second main and, and stuff sometimes. It's got to be, uh, uh, I'm sure the the uh, accountants had a lot to say about that. Yeah, cost, cost, cost. Um, William asks about the uh, Horseshoe Curve, a great place to check out. Is there some place to find some sort of a schedule for rail traffic? Um, if you go to the uh, train aficionado uh, page again, um, I've got several uh, different things about the curve. I'll pull it up right now, and we can share it on the. Yeah. On the one the thing with freight trains is they really don't run on schedules, although they are more regular these days than they used to be. But they don't run on set schedules. Let me just uh, zoom this. They uh, they have. 
operating patterns, I guess is the best way to put it, where uh, like the auto, uh, the automobile train tends to run at uh, around in the late afternoon uh, type of thing, but uh, they're not uh, they're not scheduled um, per se. Now, uh, Amtrak and commuter trains do operate on schedules, or well, they try to operate on schedule anyway. But uh, freight trains are uh, not uh, are not scheduled. Even though, even with PSR precision scheduled rail fanning, or precision scheduled railroading, um, they're not always you know, on there. So they're going to be like the the first train there, number two twenty six T. It's usually they're from about a quarter after eight till around ten in the morning. Yeah, this is um, a source that I was able to pick up from the uh, the horseshoe curve, uh, which they provide you with a sheet. And what I was able to do is uh, kind of break it down a little bit more to all the eastbound and westbounds. Um, and this is from March of uh, 2020. So what I did is I put all the eastbounds together, put all the westbounds together, put the time ranges and what type of train it is. So you can download this off of uh, my website, uh, train aficionado and then go to the trackside guides and this is the ultimate rail fanning guide uh, for Altoona PA um, it has the uh, the road and dispatch channels um, I also have created a uh, mile post sheet which you can take a look here uh, which is awesome to be able to see where all the detectors are and to be able to see what the the key names of these areas are so if you hear it referred to on the radio um i have to update the frequencies on this because this is a bit dated here but yeah. um but yeah i mean this is uh the ultimate guide and you can take a look at some of the rail fanning spots uh which i give an address and then a preview of what your photos will look like in this area you know to see what the views are and of course here's the horseshoe curve um you know and there's a heritage unit going around the curve and uh you know all types of different locations here to take a look at with addresses points of interest including restaurants as we can see here a lot of people know about vito's oh, um, <laughs> vito's pizza and then um you know a whole bunch of stuff here so definitely uh take a look at train aficionado and at the trackside guides uh, we hope to have more trackside guides across the country as i'm able to to be able to rail fan out there but definitely take a look at that everything that you need for the horseshoe curve you know i've been there a few times and i'm going to continue working on that so uh the other thing you might want to consider doing is if you're planning or you want to go rail fanning someplace see if somebody's got a live camera there or at least a scanner feed for that area and that'll give you kind of a feel. You can watch that ahead of time. You can get kind of a feel for what uh, what's going on. You can say, oh, it looks like they're busy in the afternoons, but they've got this uh, slack period. And the other thing, too, is be aware that railroads tend to do uh, most of their track maintenance during the daytime, of course. And if they're if they've got a track closed for uh, for maintenance, they might close the entire railroad down for an afternoon. I had that the third or fourth time I went to the curve. Uh, there had been a derailment a few miles away, and there was no traffic going across the curve, and it was pretty much a bust. I ended up going down to Cumberland, Maryland, because at least there were some trains moving that day. Uh, let's see here, um, and let's see uh, Hawkeye Colors for the football team here in Iowa. So. Uh, that was uh, one of the uh, one of the railroads we saw a picture of there. Uh, that Michigan Northern unit looked like uh, the Vermont Railway. Um, yes, yeah, the Vermont Railways. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I actually had pictures of that of the time I rode the Vermont Railway a couple, three or four shows ago. One of their units there. I, I actually rode that. I was uh, dropping off my girlfriend in the Boston area, where she was going to college at the time. And after I dropped her off, I went up to uh, uh, Vermont and Maine and up into Quebec, and I rode the Vermont Railway. So it, was, uh, it was pretty cool. So that was back in late 80s. <laughs> wow. Uh, distant signals. Uh, there was a question about trains in Florida. So uh, one of our friends is uh, down in Florida. He's one about trains. 
Uh, there are trains in Florida, uh, CSX, Florida East Coast, a couple other short lines. Um, Norfolk Southern, do they get down into Florida? I would assume so. A little bit, I would say, Maybe but not. Yeah. But it's mostly uh, a lot of CSX country yeah, for the most part. CSX yeah. is based out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And then uh, Norfolk Southern's operation is now in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And, uh, of course, you got the Florida East Coast uh, on east coast of florida you got the seminole golf and a few other short lines uh we used to spend a lot of time in uh sarasota and at that time it was still coastline um uh, and now that's on uh that spring run by a short line through there but uh if you uh do uh after we're done go uh do a search on youtube for uh, distant signals and that's danny uh who we've had on the show and uh he rail fans northern florida quite a bit and uh, he talks about some of the locations that he uh, uh, that he travels to uh, Chicago rail net yeah um, that was the uh, the current name of the uh, uh, the old LaSalle Bureau County operations uh, that was the Chicago International Port uh, the problem with Florida uh, there's not a, a whole lot of uh, okay they only go to Jacksonville okay there's not a whole lot of railroad activity through Florida. You would that for a state that big and populous that you would think, but you got to remember. Look at the geography. It's at the end of everything. You don't go through Florida. You go to or you come from. You don't go through it. That's one of the reasons why there's so many trains in Flagstaff or in Chicago. It's because you got stuff coming from every direction. You got a lot of stuff going through there. In Florida, it's at the end of everything. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. Uh, which, uh, which railroad was that used to run to Petoskey? I think uh, that was the Pennsylvania. Petoskey, Michigan, which is in northern Michigan. Uh, northern part of this of the lower peninsula. And let's see here. Um, yeah, riding the Empire Builder at 90 miles an hour. That's uh, scary. Yeah, if you want to be scary... Uh, right on uh, some of the freight railroad, you know, some of the Amtrak trains and some of the freight railroads, that this track is meant for big, huge, heavy coal trains, not meant for fast uh, passenger trains. And especially if you're on the upper level of a super liner car, because you're already up high, and so you get a little bit more swaying note motion. Yeah, you can get a little uh, seasick right now. <laughs> And let's see, the Lehigh Valley unit is on uh, train 20W in Pennsylvania. And it's uh, painted in Cornell Red is what the name of that uh, color is. And let's see here. Um, Dale uses his iPhone to take pictures of the Q trains in lower Manhattan. Um, I assume that uh, Q train, I assume that's what, a subway line? Oh yeah, yeah Manhattan. Yeah, that's yeah. A, the subway line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time I was in Manhattan, I uh, uh, there was a uh, a bomb that actually was set off on one of the uh, um, one of the uh, platforms at a subway station about four or five miles from where I was staying, and uh, so that made kind of a mess of traffic in <laughs> Lower Manhattan that day. Um, thankfully, it was a small one, but it was just making noise. And let's see here. Where are we? Um, let's see here. Uh, Troy uh, uses an ICOM uh, two-way radio with the transmit uh, disabled for a railroad receiver. Uh, professional two-way radios, Motorola's, ICOM, Kenwood's, they actually do make great uh, mobile radios to listen to railroads. Uh, very sensitive. Again, if you're going to do that, make sure you have the transmit disabled because you don't want to accidentally uh, transmit on a railroad channel. I don't know if Carmen's watching us this evening, if he's checked in. Mm -hmm. Uh, That smiley antenna, I actually ordered one of those, so I'm going to actually try it out. There was a smiley antenna for the railroads 
Um, so I ordered that. Um, so hopefully by next uh, show, maybe I'll have a review of, of that particular antenna uh, cool. to be able to provide a, a lot of our viewers that are either using a, a two-way radio or a scanner to monitor the local railroads. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the NXDN situation for about a minute here. Um, there have uh, been a lot of people in angst about NXDN. Um, it's coming for the railroads, but it won't be uh, tomorrow. It no. Will be, you know, it'll, we'll probably know about a year in advance of any of the major railroads switching road operations to NXDN. It's going to take about that long to coordinate things with all the other railroads and personnel that need to have radios. So if you really want to get prepared, uh, get an NXDN capable scanner or an NXDN capable radio. But I wouldn't rush out and buy one until uh, um, and it'll be well publicized a long time in advance before you can uh, uh, before you get shut out with an analog radio. And the good thing about it, if you do have a radio that's capable uh, and you hear rumblings of them testing, mm -hmm. you'll be able to monitor the testing, which is going to yeah. be great to be able to see what reception is going to look like for you in the future. That's what um once we get you know some word that they're testing that's going to be good for us as scanner enthusiasts to see what we hear are they using the same frequencies are they using a different road channel a different dispatch what the reception is going to overall look like is it going to be good is it going to be bad is it going to be yeah. <laughs> i mean all these things are yet a mystery because none of the class one railroads have gone to a digital trunk a digital system right. like this so yeah. and and the digital that they are using the nxdn that they are using now is limited mostly to just things like yard operations or car shops yeah uh, we're talking so about it's NXDN, a, we're talking about going on the road channel that's what it really yeah is. i mean that's the thing i'm curious about is how is that going to be for us, yeah. you know, for monitoring. I mean, is it going to be a huge benefit? Are we, are we going to be able to hear more yeah. further away? And the neat thing about it is, are they, one of the other neat things is, are they going to have identifiers like locomotive numbers coming up over the radio so that we'll be able to see, hey, that's, you know, that's the 4161 that's talking on the radio because you can do that with digital radios. And so that might be um, a, a boom to the rail fan. Yeah, I mean that's gonna be. I'm curious to see how this all plays out to the to the average rail fan once this happens. Yeah, and there was a there was a big thread on Radio Reference and um, recently about Norfolk uh, Southern uh, modifying all their licenses or some of their licenses anyway to remove analog channels from them. Uh, basically, what they were doing is they're just cleaning up their licensing. Even even if they do pull the analog channels off of all their licenses, um, they're not moving from analog right now, and it'll be a while, and we will know about it long before they do. And I bet the thing with their radios, even once they switch to from analog to digital, I guarantee they will still have analog capability for certain instances, especially yeah. with um, if they're not getting enough distance. Let's say there's a one of these super trains that are really long and the digital is not cutting it for the conductor yeah. to call the engineer and they know that the analog will work there's yeah. going to be some you know switch over to i can't hear you switch yeah. over to the other channel yeah so they'll, <laughs> they'll still have analog capabilities for a while at least eventually uh they will switch over to all digital all the time but It'll be a while before that happens. And again, we'll know about long before that happens. So uh, don't fret. It's still going to be analog for a while. And I think uh, we're about there, my friend. All right. So let's um, let's remind you of a couple of things that are going on. Um, what I'll do is I'll pull up, uh, 
pull up a couple of slides and we'll wrap it up for this evening. Um, I want to thank you so much to everybody that's joined us this evening. This is, uh, occurs on the first Monday of every month. Uh, this is Train Aficionado Live. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Our goal is to get the channel to a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. Uh, this will be a huge help for us to get to this uh, thousand subscribers. So tell your friends, tell your rail fan buddies um, to subscribe to the channel. That's going to be a huge help. We're trying to grow this as much as we can. Uh, our goal is a thousand by the end of the year. Hopefully, we can reach that. Um, make sure you follow us on all of our other social media as well uh, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, check out our website, trainaficionado.com. While you're there, uh, check out the trackside guides um, and also uh, sign up for our newsletter, the trackside bulletin. We send a newsletter occasionally, so definitely uh, check out. The, the website for that and sign up for that today and um, make sure you join us for uh, Rich and I we host another show which is called the scanner guys where we talk about police scanners and so on we are gonna have a hammer operator jock um, he's going to be talking about um, some of the uh, uh, traffic nets that, that that he operates in the Albany area and that'll be uh, this Wednesday uh, July the 7th 8 p.m. Eastern Time 5 p.m. Pacific that'll be live on the Scanner Guys YouTube channel and Train Aficionado Live is going to be back with you Monday April um, April Monday August the 2nd 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, subscribe to our channel right now and definitely follow us on all of our social media. Uh, we appreciate uh, appreciate you guys joining us and make sure you give our videos a, a thumbs up as well. That'll help. Um, but I think that's going to do it for us this evening. Um, if anybody uh, wants to uh, reach me about a uh, about you know somebody that could possibly want to be a guest on the show or uh, pass along some information to me, um, I can be reached via email at trainaficionado at gmail.com. That's trainaficionado at gmail.com. Um, and then it looks like uh, you know someone wants to work on another trackside guide, which I'm really excited about to add that to the website so we can have trackside guides from all over the country. That would be my goal. Um, Carmen, yes, you are there, and I will uh, let you know how that antenna works. I'm looking forward to that. Should be here tomorrow with any luck. Um, but yeah, anything else you want to add, Rich, before we leave? Uh, no, I think so about it. All right. Well, I'm Jonathan Higgins. I'm Rich Carlson. Well, happy and safe rail fanning to you. We'll catch you in August right here on Train Aficionado Live. So have a great evening. And we'll see you on Wednesday. See you Wednesday.